part three. It's also four pages, but I will, I will skip some of it. We have seen some of these things already. This article was written by Father Dulac, The Jurisdiction of the Bull Quo Primum of Pope St. Pius V. Father Dulac was one of the first canonists in the late 60s, early 70s, who stood up to uh, defend Quo Primum. And he was there, he's, he's French. He was also formed, by the way, in a French seminary in Rome, at the same time as Archbishop Lefebvre, Doctor of Theology and Canon Law. He wrote a number of articles about legal matters in the late 60s, like the legality of communion in the hand, the legality of the new mass. So we can defend the, the lawfulness, the legality of the old mass, and then we can dispute the, even the value of the new mass as a law. Even if I told you Paul VI gave the new mass as a permission, we can, and they have even analyzed that permission. The way he did it was, was not right. There's some flaws into even the imposition of the new law. I told you one, which was the last paragraph of Mistale Roman, they forgot to give the date. When does this start? They added it later on. After they published the law, they changed it. By adding a clause, they forgot. So, that's what did you like. You find uh, most of this in Paul, Michael Davies, Pope Paul's New Mass. So, the preliminary remarks, we have seen that. Okay, it's a law that uh, there was just a derogation. That's all it was. What I want to insist on, turn the page. Uh, just one second here, okay. So, I'm at page two. The third line is point number three. Point number three. The will of the legislator is invested with varied nuance. So, the will of St. Pius V has many nuances which are given in detail in the lengthy enunciated, enunciated final sentence concerning which we have pointed out that this is not merely done for the sake of emphasis. And here, uh, he says, as an excellent exercise in respectful attention, the reader can easily place each of these 11 terms alongside a corresponding provision of the bull. The, bull. the 11 terms are, not hong pagitam nostripam, permissionis. The first word, one, permissionis. Two, statuti. I'm looking in English underneath. Permission, statute, Ordinance, command, direction, grant, indult, declaration, will, decree, and prohibition. So, all these words mean something in canon law. And it shows the mind of St. Pius V. He also, in the point number five, he specifies minutely for whom, so the persons, when, the time, where the places to which the provision of co-primum apply. Point six, he gives sanctions. Those who do not follow this, there will be sanctions. Seven is, is important for the custom. As you know, and that's a big difference with Paul VI. People say, St. Pius V, made a new Mass. 400 years later, Paul VI made a new Mass. They're both Pope. Each time was after a council. It's the same. Paragraph 7. The Pope does not promulgate a new Missal with this law. He restores 
the existing one. That's what we said at the beginning. He asked the expert to go to the monasteries, in the old libraries, find me the old books. And what the fathers have said, the old council, about how was Mass said in the 5th century. That is what we want to restore. Nevertheless, he states clearly where, there, where that which existed before has been subjected to partial derogation or total abrogation. Okay, it's very technical here, okay. Uh, Okay, so we have, we have numbers in Romans and numbers in, in, in Arabic, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And here, number 3, the bull respect established rights. So these are the privileges. Okay. And what are the privileges? Pope Pius V confirms two rights. Churches or communities which have enjoyed the use of their own missile, Approved since its institution. You had the Dominicans, you had the Franciscans, and you have others like this. They may keep their rights. That of missal, a missal similarly distinct from the Roman one, which can claim to have been in use for over 200 years, this confirmation of existing rights we're not removing these rights, he says, is not to be confused with permission and with the indult which follow. The Pope is saying, is only saying, you have that right, we're maintaining it, we're not removing it. Auferimus means to remove. So, we are leaving you your, your right, your privilege. In the new Mass, Misada Romanum, he does not say, if you read it again, uh, for whom does this apply? The people? The places? And the time, as I told you, he added later on, the first Sunday of, the, of Advent. But... It was added later on. It's not, it, there's a law, okay, for where, when, and for whom does the law apply? Paul VI does not mention it. And, very interesting, later he will give privilege or permission for whom? Old and sick priests and sine populo. You can say the old mass as long as there's nobody there. That's what he said. And, uh, and Father Dulac shows that the church is the mother and the church respects certain customs and privileges in different countries. Another example of a custom, which is an interesting one, I don't think you've seen it, is blue vestments. We have blue vestments in the Philippines. They have it in Spain, the Spanish countries. In the Philippines, we can say mass with blue vestments on December 8. We don't have, in the Roman rites, blue vestments. But that's a, an exception. It's a privilege the Spanish countries have, uh, as in the Philippines. To say mass, so that's a privilege. So, uh, and if that is uh, so, that is maintained. That's been going on for so many years. Another, another tradition or a custom in the Philippines. Lots of things in the Philippines, but here's another one, which we have, which, according to the scholars in the Philippines, could be a a custom going back to Saint Paul. I read an ancient one, is what they call the Sanctus Candle. When we say Mass, when a priest reads the preface, the altar boy, during the preface, the altar boy brings a third candle and he puts it on the altar for the Sanctus. 
and that will stay there until after communion. So the Sanctus candle, which we do for the bishop, and uh, it's, a, it's an immemorial custom which the Spaniards have, which entered in the Philippines, and we're using it, we're doing it, our priests are doing it in the Philippines. Uh, that's one custom which we, we, it'd be wrong for us to start doing it here because it was never the custom here. But it's the custom in some countries. So the church allows this. Okay. So the Paul the sixth by the fifth confirms to right. There's personal preferences in the sense that the communities that have a very ancient missal, more than 200 years old, he does not remove their privilege, but he gives them permission to use also this missal. Okay? He gives them, he gives rooms for personal preference. Five, the bulk grants a privilege, we have seen that. Uh, turn the page. That is important here, okay? Uh, page three, number four at the top. So, I want to insist a little bit on, and he does here, on the notion of privilege. St. Pius V conceded, as we have seen, exceptions to the norms laid down in his missal. Now, we see that in addition to the obligation which the ball imposes, he adds a privilege which favors his own missal. This privilege is to be effective in all cases and at all times. Furthermore, by virtue of the terms of these presents, of this, this document, in virtue of our apostolic authority. That is powerful when the Pope says that. We grant and concede. And so Father Dulac makes seven observations. What stands out in this section, he says first, of the bull is the use of the verbs concedimus et indulgemus. So we grant and concede, which introduce it. The correct signification is of a favor which attains the legal status of a private law. As in the present case, the privilege adds itself to the law. It's like the general law to which a particular law is added. It must be understood as conferring a new authority upon it which takes precedence in all cases, present and in the future, where the law of coprimum might be made the object of a derogation. If somebody says we make like Paul VI, he derogated, but then by the fifth said, no, 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 we got that privilege. Therefore, even when the law ceases to bind, the privilege continues to exist. I explained that to you before. Second point. The importance of this privilege is emphasized by the words in virtue of our apostolic authority, which the Pope invokes before conferring it. Three. This privilege is granted without exception to every priest, secular, in every church, for every form of mass, low mass, some mass, high mass, pontifical mass, Okay, that's what it means. Four, you notice we're looking at all the aspects of this law. The nature, the importance, who can, uh, who are aimed at by this law. Four, the superiors. No superior may impede the use of this privilege for any reason, either privately or publicly. Of course, they did that in the Novus Ordo. In Novus Ordo communities, they forbade priests to say the traditional mass. That's a sheer abuse of authority. They had no right to do that by virtue of co-primo. Five. Those accorded the privilege, so the priests who, all the priests who have this privilege, 
cannot be obliged by anyone whatsoever to use another missile, a Kolibet Koji Kompelli, or to implement even the slightest modifications to the missile of Pius V. That's what we said about the, the prayers of Good Friday. So I have that, it's a private law, I have that privilege. Nobody can force me to say Mass differently. Six, this concession has no need of any additional permission, agreement, or consent. The bull states, by the terms of these presents, which are thus considered adequate to suffice. And finally, it is a matter of a perpetual privilege. It's young perpetual. So, the final statement, says Father Dulac, leads us to a question which affects each and every legislative disposition of the bull. To what extent can a pope bind his successors? That's a delicate question, but he's going to answer uh, in a limited way. So, go to point number six. Point number six. Um, so he's making first, it's the power a pope has on another pope. And um, he's making a different distinction between divine law and a, a church law. He's making this here. A divine power and a, a ecclesiastical power. Look at the section 3 at the bottom there. The last section of page 3. Con considering the content, the perpetuity of coprimum is confirmed by three characteristics. The aim in view, which is that there, sorry, there should be no comma here, which is that there should be but one missile, so that the unity of faith may be protected and manifested by unity of public prayer. Paul VI used that argument of unity in his missile, which is it's really a deception. Because he says we the unity of that Paul the Sixth aim is the unity of internal prayer. Everybody will be praying, but externally it will be total diversity, total chaos, there will be no unity. A Japanese priest cannot say the new mass with an English priest if they don't know one another's language. They can't pray together. It's, it's, okay. they, they, it's not the same. So the aim of St. Pius V is the unity of public prayer, the method of the bull cor primum, of its establishment, which is neither that of an artificial creation devised from a number of possibilities, nor even a radical reform, but what Pius V said was a restoration of an ancient, of the ancient Roman Missal. That is a well-proven past and becomes the best guarantee of a tranquil future. It's not something Pius V composed. Even where he added things like the prayers at the foot of the altar or the last gospel, these practices, these customs, were being said in a number of places. So he observed that these were particular customs in a number of places, so he raised that at the level of a universal law. That's what he did. He did not say, oh, it'd be nice to have uh, the person of the altar, I like them. He said, no. He said, there are, they have been said, so we're going to maintain them. Three, it's authorship, so here, the authorship of this bull, is that of a pope acting with all the force of his apostolic authority, in exact conformity with the express wish of an ecumenical council, such as Trent, in conformity with the uninterrupted tradition of the Roman Church, 
and so far as concerned the principal parts of the missile in conformity with the universal church. So the bull pro prima is extremely weighty, extremely heavy by its authority. Four, each of these characteristics taken separately and still more when taken together assure us that, be careful here, no pope can ever licitly abrogate the bull of Pro Primo. Licitly means uh, without a sin. Licit is the question of sinful. Okay? If it's licit, it's not a sin. If it's illicit, it'll be sinful. Even if we admit that he can do so validly and without betraying either the deposit of faith or any fundamental law of the church. So, it would be, in other words, a pope could try to do this, and if he knows well canon law, he says, I suppress the old mass as a universal law, as an immemorial custom, as a privilege. He says all three, okay? But he would be betraying the deposit of faith. He would be betraying tradition. And uh, it would be a sin to do that, says Father Dulac. So, and in fact, it's indisputable that Paul VI has not made any such abrogation. And that's how the new mass came in, because in 69, it did not touch the old mass. He said, well, that's okay. We still have the old. But the, the, the mediatic campaign, it pushed out the old. So paragraph six. It's a, that's an important thing. That's what I just said. Unfortunately, says Father Dulac, however, it seems equally undisputable on one hand, uh, de jure, in matters of law, Paul VI did not abrogate the old mass, according to the law, but in practice, that's what he says here, it's indisputable that Paul VI favors the de facto, in practice, the abolition of the Roman mission whether by deliberate will or connivance or tolerance, or by constraint due to obscure pledges from which he cannot free himself, or, of, or which make him their prisoner. And Father Dulac says, he who resists the failing of a pontiff for a day serves the eternal papacy. We are living this today with Pope Francis. So, uh, we can read the other parts. Okay, the councils for concerning a respectful resistance, and he gives different rules. Look at the last paragraph of page four, just above the footnote. And this is a man who's a doctor of canon law of theology, who has served 30 years before Vatican II, uh, we are so certain of this doctrine, what he says before, that we feel able to add this final recommendation. If, and God forbid, any superior of whatever right should presume to deny to priests, religious or faithful, the, the exercise of these rights, they may and should denounce to the competent authority by every legitimate means, this infraction of the bull sent by the fifth as an unlawful abuse of their authority. So you have this, you have this right to, if, to have a traditional mass because you're Catholic and it's Catholic, and we have the duty to give it to you. And we have the right to say it. But Father Dulac says it's 1972. Where were we in 1972? Okay. We're just, most of us, just following the flow. And nobody dares, dares say anything against tradition, against the new math. 
because you'll be kicked out. Where do you go? There's no traditional mass. You don't know what to do. Everybody thinks he's alone. It took a while for people to realize there was reaction worldwide. It took a long while. In Sherbrooke, I know it started in, in uh, early 73, so 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, four years where there was no traditional mass. And people just, just went to the new mass. And then you hear, oh, there's a priest saying the old mass. Oh, there's one here, there's one in Montreal, but there's one in Quebec, and there's one in, in, in another place. Or, oh, and then people start hearing about it, the news spreads, and, and people start going to the old mass. But uh, as he says here, those who forbid the old mass are doing an unlawful abuse of their authority. And unfortunately, it still happens today. In spite of Sumorum Pontificum, uh, I almost had an issue a month ago in Montreal when we came to a church in Notre Dame de Bon Secours to say the old mass. The lady, the lady, the pastoral agent, was freaking out when she found out we were going to have the old mass. But I said, Madame, the Pope wants it. I know, but the bishop does not allow it. Oh. I said, but, but who's the head of the church? I know, but the bishop says no. I know, but the Pope is above the bishop. And we had a five minute, a few minutes discussion. And uh, oh, she, at the end, she, she says, well, I know this mass. I had it when I was young. But uh, she didn't want to have trouble with the bishop. But it's the same everywhere. It's the same everywhere. So I hope this helps you to, to, to secure you in going to the old mass, no matter where, no matter when, I would say. But traditional mass is really our Catholic inheritance. It's our family treasure. It's the, the ladder of Jacob leading to heaven. Nobody can, can forbid us to climb that ladder. And, uh, but it's interesting, just to finish, studying St. Pius V also reminds us the way the church used to speak. The, church, the way the church used to make law. It's so clear compared to Paul VI and Francis and whatever. After Vatican II, it's wishy-washy. It's not, the so modernism has affected not just philosophy and theology, but canon law. And uh, so it's a hold on to tradition. That's the answer. Thank you very much.